forward, let me quickly review the overall view of systematic reviews that we're going to be uh, looking at in this session. Okay. So the the overall the overall um, plan of a systematic review, and I'll talk a little bit more about systematic, but it generally means you're following some rigorous steps to make sure you do everything you need to do. Uh, the first step, number one, is you need to identify the purpose of the review. There's many different kinds of literature reviews, and so you identify why do you need a literature review and what kind of literature review are you going to be doing. And uh, actually, that's what today's session will focus on, uh, identifying the purpose of a liter literature review. After you've identified the purpose, the next step is drafting the protocol and training the research team. So the protocol is basically a plan of all the steps you're going to follow for the literature review. And next week when we cover that, I'll, uh, well, the, the paper already talks, the two articles talk about why it's so important that it's a step on its own to assure a rigorous, high-quality study. Then step three is applying the practical screen which means deciding which articles are you going to include in your review, which ones are you not going to review. Step four is searching the literature. So this is when people think of a literature review, this is the primary step they think about. It's when you actually start searching for the articles you want to include. Step five is extracting the data. Once you've identified all the articles, you read them and you look for the information that you're going to work with. Uh, to, in the later synthesis stage. Next is appraising the quality of all the articles. So this is, and there's different kinds of literature reviews. You don't always do this. Some of them you just summarize everything you receive. Other times you need to look at what are high quality articles, what are low quality articles. And so high quality articles would have more weight in your final interpretation of results and lower quality articles. So we'll talk about that in detail later. Then um, the biggest step, and probably the single most important step, is synthesizing the studies. And that's now you've identified maybe 20 studies, 50 studies, you've, looked, you've extracted information from them. How do you put it together to tell one story? And so that's the synthesis stage. And finally, you write the review, which is putting everything together uh, and presenting it. Okay, so these are the eight steps. And the sessions that I will have focus on each of these eight steps to elaborate on them in detail. Reading the articles um, that I've sent you explain each of these eight steps in quite a lot of detail. But so in the class sessions, as you'll see today, I'm going to go more in depth. So I've sent you this uh, slide here that I'm going to go over. So now we'll focus on the uh, on step one, the objectives or the purpose specifically of theory mining reviews. Okay. So first, what is a literature review? The general subject of this course. Uh, there's many, many definitions. Uh, but the one that I find most practical for my purposes is one um, presented by Arlene Fink. She's written uh, a book about conducting research literature reviews. And she defines literature review as a systematic, explicit, comprehensive, and reproducible method for identifying, evaluating, and synthesizing the existing body of completed and recorded work produced by researchers, scholars, and practitioners. Okay, so um, the f I highlighted the key items in her definition. First is systematic, and this means it follows a rigorous procedure. Now, I'll say that uh, this definition is not so much a systemic definition, in the sense that you can have a literature view that does not meet all these criteria, and it's still... A literature review, but this is a de this is more of a normative definition, uh, or you could call it an extrinsic uh, value definition that explains the criteria of a good literature review. 
out. So this is what a good literature review should be a coin uh, think. So first, it's systematic means that it follows a rigorous procedure. It doesn't just you look for some articles, think up a story, and write them down. Uh, no, there are certain steps to make sure that the quality of your review is at a high standard. And so, uh, obviously, this course is about taking a systematic approach to literature reviews. Next, it needs to be explicit. Explicit means that you don't hide your details. You talk about what you did, what you considered, why you did it. So that when other people are reading the report of your literature review, they understand what went behind a procedure. Next, comprehensive means uh, you try to capture everything, or you try to capture as much as possible. Uh, so some literature reviews are very selective. They just say, okay, let's look at articles from the top 10 journals, the most top 10 most reputable journals in our field. That is not comprehensive. That is a selective review. Actually, there is a place for that, and I will talk about that in depth. That, uh, so not all reviews have to be comprehensive. Uh, the other extreme would be exhaustive. Exhaustive means you capture everything, every single thing that exists, uh, every single p article that people have written that have something to do with your topic is included. Uh, practically speaking, it's almost impossible to be exhaustive, to capture everything. So the goal is generally to be comprehensive. You, you try your best. You make a sincere effort. And you realize you might have missed some things, but you, because of your sincere effort, you believe whatever you missed is not that important. So that's one criterion. And reproducible means that you are trying to record your review, do it in a way that other people could do the same thing, follow the same steps you did, and get pretty much the same result. So that's a very scientific approach to doing a literature review, uh, where you is very important uh, for science. Reproducibility is very important. Now, I just make a comment here that this the re re uh, reproducible implies a positivistic philosophy of science which means a philosophy of science that the truth is out there. There is an objective truth, and there's one objective truth, and when you are doing a literature review, you're trying to find that objective truth. Well, that's not the only way to see the world. Uh, personally, I believe uh, tr truth, there are some truths that are objective, that yes, they are out there, there's one truth out there, but there are other truths which are subjective or relativistic. There's some truths that um, it depends on your perspective. Uh, so, for example, just a very simplistic example, how many countries are there in Africa? I believe there's 51 now with the addition of South Sudan. Well, that's an objective truth. Um, even though that's debatable, some people say it's Somalia country, it doesn't have stable government, would you count that, so on. But generally, that's objective truth. Uh, but then if you say, uh, what is the best football team in Africa? Well, then everyone will raise their hand for their own country. And you have to say that's a relative truth. Some people say, well, the one that's won the most games. Others say the one that's gone farthest in the World Cup. Uh, everyone has their own criteria. It's true for them. So that's an example of a relative truth. It, it's... Uh, People have different perspectives that they can all make their arguments. So uh, this idea of, um, I know I'm going philosophical here, but I'm going to dip into philosophy of science a lot in this. Uh, and at least in one other session, I'll go more in depth into it. Because it, it is very important to be conscious of your philosophy of science when you're doing uh, any kind of research. Uh, and being aware that there's different ways to look at the world and different ways even to understand truth.
Yes. Um, the, the question I have is about the philosophical stance. If, if you are using um, a constructivist uh, approach to, yes. to research, would, would it be uh, important or would it be applicable to use uh, a systematic literature review for, for that research if you're using a constructivist? Because I just saw you said it works with the, with the positivist um, epistemology. That's right. So the constructivist uh, uh, research epistemology considers that, it, it mainly considers the social world. It, it pertains mainly to social sciences and says that the institutions and the concepts we have in our in humans relating to each other do not really exist objectively. They're all in our mind. We all have our own perspective and we construct our own worlds in our minds. We can communicate them to each other, but they only exist as we communicate with each other. They don't have an objective reality. Uh, so, for a constructivist perspective, yes, it still needs to be systematic. Systematic is absolutely necessary because you can't just make stuff up. You can't just say whatever comes to your mind. You need a formal approach. Okay, so uh, if you're constructivist, you still want to be systematic. You still want to be explicit. If anything, you want to be even more explicit since with constructivism, you can... Each person has their way of thinking of things, so you absolutely have to be explicit how you thought about things, why you thought about it. You, again, need to be comprehensive uh, you, because you're attempting to include all relevant literature. Uh, the main difference is that if you're a constructivist, then you do not really care about reproducibility. And that's definitely the case. That's for constructivist literature reviews, reproducibility is not the goal. Um, and that's why I made that note just for reproducibility. Okay? Yes. Sorry, sorry, Prof. Just another additional follow-up question. Yes. Yes, so if, if you're taking that approach, what, what changes in the, in the seven steps? None of... All the steps remain the same. It's just... Uh, um, when we come to synthesis... And actually, next week, I'll talk a little bit about synthesis early on. And uh, if I don't talk about this, remind me about it. The main difference will be synthesis. There's many different synthesis approaches. And uh, some are very much suitable for constructivism, and some are not. So that's where you would see the biggest differences. But the, there will still be the eight steps. Okay, so that's what a literature review is. Next, what is theory? Uh, this is a very big, big topic, and I can only give you a brief introduction and a particular perspective, but um, there's many different definitions of theory, and I've read a lot of them, I've looked at a lot of them, but I guess uh, for my perspective, especially the perspective that I'm taking here, now, I have to say that my field of research is management information systems. Management information systems is basically about uh, human beings using ICTs. Human beings have goals, purposes, intentions, and ICT is a tool to accomplish these things. So it's a field that intersects uh, ICTs, uh, information technology, with uh, human sociology, human psychology, uh, organizational uh, science and so on. So it's primarily a social science, but it also has a lot of applied uh, technology, even engineering aspects. So from my perspective, I have a particular definition of theory. Someone from another field would have another uh, definition. However, I think this definition is general enough that it is quite applicable to most sciences, both natural science and social science. Okay, so here goes. Theory is an integrated collection of explanations about the relationships between one or more pairs of concepts that represent real-world phenomena under specified conditions. Such explanations might be accompanied with predictions and implications for intervention and action. Okay, so I 
bolded the most important aspects of this definition. The first being concept. So, uh, actually, I didn't cite it here, but you notice I have concepts, what, relationships, how, explanations, why. In uh, the article I sent you about theory mining reviews, I referred to an article by Wetton, 1989, which is a really excellent article I re highly recommend. Uh, probably the single uh, best, simplest, most straightforward definition of theory that I've ever seen. And he uses those terms to kind of explain theory. So first, the concepts are what are you theorizing about? What exactly are you talking about? What kind of things? And so there's going to be things that vary in value, or sometimes your things that you're theorizing are events that have a, an order in time. Sometimes there's things that have different states. Uh, relationships, then, are how the concepts are related to each other. So some con your, a theory is always the relationship between concepts. How is something related? So, for example, if you're saying that uh, the economy will improve if there's more investment in ICT, then you have two concepts. Your, con your first concept is ICT investment. Your second co concept is the state of the economy. And the relationship, you're saying there's a relationship between the two. And you're saying there's a causal relationship that increased IC investment will cause increase economic uh, output. Reduced IC investment causes reduced economic output. So those are your two concepts and the relationship is what your is how the two are linked. Then a, then but that's not enough to be a theory because if you've taken courses on quantitative analysis, one of the things you always are told is that a correlation is not causation. So just because two things are correlated, that means both go up at the same time, doesn't necessarily mean there's a true relationship between them. Therefore, a theory must explain the relationship. It must explain why they are related. Uh, it might be causality, or it might be there's a third factor. Maybe increased IC investments is related to increased foreign investments. And increased foreign investment increases IC investment. Increased foreign investment also increases um, economic outputs. So without an explanation, it's not a theory. That's it. It's just a correlation. And the correlation could be chance. It could be anything. But a theory says here's at least two concepts. They are related. And here's why. You're explaining why they're related. Uh, and the explanation is a single most important part of the theory because without the explanation, it's not a theory. Then another very important aspect of theory is the bounding conditions. So that's basically understanding that a theory is not applicable in all situations for all people without exception. Uh, there's always some limitations, some restrictions. So maybe, again, using an example, IC investments increase economic output. Maybe you say that is only applicable in countries with stable political situations. But it is not applicable in countries that are at war or countries that are facing severe uh, uh, political turmoil. Then that becomes your bounding condition, it's saying it's your theory only applies in certain situations. And this is a very important part of theory because when you're trying to test a theory in the real world, there will be some exceptions, there'll be some cases where it does not apply. And the explanation should also say where it applies and why it applies in these scenarios but not in other scenarios. So these are the four major cat the four core aspects of every theory. Every theory to be complete has these four aspects. Okay. Uh, let me talk about concepts before I take questions on this. Because that's probably the 
the Vegas part. Uh, one, one thing I'll say, though, in this uh, definition, I said that there's concepts that represent real-world phenomena. Okay, so I mentioned uh, briefly that there's positivist uh, worldviews that assume there's an objective reality, and there's constructivist, constructivist worldviews that um, say that social reality is just in our heads. The philosophy of science that I personally adopt is called critical realism. And I briefly refer to it in the Theory Mind Review uh, article. And critical realism accepts both positivism and constructivism. It says that mainly for the, social, the natural sciences, uh, the world, uh, positivism is a more meaningful way to see things. And for the, for the social sciences, reality is socially constructed, but critical realism considers socially constructed reality is real. In other words, people, even though, uh, for, uh, I don't know, let, let, let me make an example. Well, I won't use an example that's too controversial. Uh, let's take an example of an organization, okay? Uh, there's a lot of theories of organization that, an, um, and maybe you can think of an informal organization. You might think of maybe a club. Well, this is a social construct. People invented it. People wrote the rules. They wrote. People invented who are the members and things like that. So constructivism tells you that there's no physical reality to a club. It's just something that exists in people's minds. Critical realism says, yes, that's true. It exists in people's minds, but what exists in my mind is the same thing that exists in your mind because we've created it in our minds, but it is objectively real. So when I say real-world phenomena, it includes socially constructed phenomena. I just want to make that comment. Okay, so, so this definition fully captures both positivist and constructivist perspectives with a critical realist's uh, epistemology. Now, concepts. There are three generally different kinds of theories, and there might be different kinds beyond these, but these are the three, and in the Theory Mining Review paper, I cite the main article from which this comes. Um, I probably should have added the citation here. It's from uh, um, Andrew Burton-Jones, um, and colleagues who just published last year or this year in uh, European Journal of Information Systems. Uh, there's three main kinds of theories, variance theories, process theories, and system theories, and they are different based on how, what kind of concepts they're looking at. A variance theory is probably the most common kind of theory that you would come across whenever you see this theory, that theory. And their concepts are also called constructs. So sometimes in the theory you see different constructs. And when you see the term construct, you know you're talking specifically about a variance theory. Uh, a lot of people don't even know there's other kinds of theories. So they say concept, construct, same thing. They assume it's everything is variance. Um, but we'll talk about the other two. Uh, so Concepts are constructs, and a construct is anything you can measure. Uh, so, coming back to my example of the variance theory, I see investments. You believe your explanation is that I see investments uh, make society uh, make processes more efficient, so productivity increases. It reduces costs, so profits increase, therefore that is why it increases economic output. So that's your theory, that's your explanation of the relationship. So you need to measure IST investments. How much in, in one economy, how much is their IC investment compared to another economy? In, then in one economy, what is their economic output that you're measuring compared to another economy, whether it's by GDP or... Uh, average firm profits or whatever you measure it, but in a variance theory, the different concepts can be measured. They can be higher, they can be lower, they might have different 
uh, values, and they vary in their values. And the con variance theory is saying that when the value of one concept varies, goes up or goes down, then the value of another concept, B, goes up or down. And that's what a variance theory is. A process theory, in contrast, is looking at a process occurring. So a sequence of events. One thing happens after another. And a process theory is saying that in order for one thing to happen, something else has to happen before it. It doesn't necessarily say that if the event or occurrence A happens, that event B must happen. But it will say that in order for B to happen, A has to happen. Uh, so anyway, I won't go into detail, but the main thing is that there's a sequence of events. One thing, after, one thing follows another, and that's what the theory is saying, that these things must happen in order to get the final outcome. And uh, so history, even though history is not a social science, history, uh, because process theories have a sequence of events, history does use process theory. But a lot of social sciences also use process theory, saying that certain things must happen in sequence in order for things to result. So anytime you have a theory, and the concepts there are the events that either they happen or they don't happen. And sometimes they might happen strongly, weakly, in order for the next one, but that uh, merges over to variance theory a little bit. So that's what a process theory is. Um, the, the next systems theories, okay, it, especially in, in the context of this class, it's a little bit hard to explain, uh, but a systems theory, however, it is important to grasp a system theory because it's extremely common. A systems theory is when you, usually when you have one thing inside another, and the thing inside another is related. So, for example, if taking the IC investment economy situation, you could say that within your Okay, so maybe an economy, you can say, consists of your service uh, industries, it consists of your agricultural industries, it consists of your marketing industries. And the growth of the economy depends uh, on the growth of the service industry, marketing industry, and uh, uh, manufacturing industry, and um, the... Um, agricultural industry. Since those industries are within the economy and are part of it, they affect each other. So it's not just saying, a system theory is not as simple as saying that you add manufacturing plus service plus agriculture and that gives you the result. Uh, then no, it's not just adding it together, but it's saying that maybe when the economy is bad, the service industry suffers the most, the agricultural industry doesn't change, the manufacturing industry suffers. Then when agriculture does very well, it affects the service industry, but it does affect the manufacturing industry. I'm just making this up as an example. But it's saying that, so you have some things within each other, and when they change, they affect the outer thing or the inner thing in different ways. That's what a system theory is. And so, that, so, so the concepts are the systems or the subsystems within those systems, and the relationships are how those systems and subsystems are, are how they vary in response to each other's changes. And again, in all of these, for there to be a theory, you have to explain why these changes occur. And so these are the three main kinds of theory. Okay, any questions so far about theory uh, and theory conceptualization for going on? Okay, no questions. Is, is that Damon uh, raising your hand? Yes. Yes. Prof. yes. yes prof. So um, I have I have two questions. Yes. So the f the first one is with respect to critical realism. You said um, that it's your own uh, ontological stance. Yes, my when, epistemological when stance. 
epistemology. Well, it's both where it's do, both ontology it and epistemology, actually. Where, do, where does it sit? Closer to positivism or closer to constructivism? <laughs> and what, what methodology works with it? Mixed methods or what? C- Critical realism is very unique because it was developed uh, by a philosopher called Roy Baskar. He's operating from the UK. And it was developed largely to embrace the two, to reconcile positivism and interpretivism. So it's, uh, it rejects the extreme forms of both. So a lot of positivism denies that there is socially constructed reality. So critical realism says that is wrong. Uh, however, critical realism emphasizes that there is an objective reality. Uh, a lot of uh, constructivism denies that socially constructed r- reality is really real. It, a lot of constructivism argues that it's just an illusion. Uh, critical realism uh, rejects that and said it's not just an illusion. It is socially constructed, but it is real. It's objective. And so critical realism really embraces both. And that's why I like it. Uh, because I, I do believe some realities are, some truths are objective and other truths are subjective. And we need to, we live in a world with both and we need to recognize which is which. And, and methodologically, methodologically, critical realism, uh, it, the primary thrust is called critical realism because it has a very strong critical social theory aspect. That's a very strong aspect of it. So it uses a lot of critical social theory methods, uh, such as discourse analysis, uh, deconstructivist approaches. Uh, It's primarily qualitative. Uh, There there are some uh, quantitative examples of critical realism, uh, because it's, it's... definitely accepts quantitative analysis, but quantitative analysis is not uniquely critically realist. The critical realism comes out mainly in qualitative studies. Okay. Okay. Then the second question is with respect to the three kinds of uh, theory and to precisely the process theory. Okay. The, conce- the concepts there, are they measurable or, or, or how, how do we... So the event and process theory, the main thing is, did the event occur or not? So let's, let, let's use the example that I'm, this kind of running example that I'm making. Suppose uh, we're saying generally that, okay, we think I see investments has an effect on economic output, but there's a step-by-step process. Uh, so first of all, there has to be you might say that there there has to be some core education and ICTs at the post-secondary level. So that has to be present. Then after that, there has to be a realization, a widespread realization in uh, corporate enterprises of the value of ICTs. Then third, there have to be laws that give uh, ICT rebates to companies that uh, hire ICT sk- uh, people with ICT skills. And then finally, you will see an effect on the economic output due to ICTs. Okay. So the process theory says, have these things occurred in, in the right sequence? The example, I made up this example, it's a very bad example, but it's just to give you an idea. It's saying that have these things occurred in the correct sequence? If they occur in the correct sequence, then you can find a final outcome. But if you're missing the final outcome, then one of those things did not occur. That's why you're not seeing the outcome in this situation. So process theories will look at many different scenarios and trace which of these events occurred and use that to explain why you find a final outcome or not. That's what a process theory would look like. That although you have these three kinds of uh, processes, they are not mutually exclusive. So it is possible for a theory to combine 
variance and process theory, or like the example Tadius was explaining, pr uh, the same theory can have a process aspect and a systems aspect that, that interact. So it's important to understand they're non mutually exclusive. However, you have to identify which is which, otherwise, your theory is not going to be clear in your mind and it's not going to be clear in how you present it or test it. Okay, so now this brings us to theory mining review. So we, uh, I've defined literature review, I've defined theory. So when you, uh, so one way of bringing them together is with what I call a theory mining review. So this is a literature review that extracts theoretical concepts from its constituent primary studies as a key aspect of the synthesis. So when you're doing a literature review, there's all kinds of things you could do. A lot of literature reviews, a lot of literature reviews um, will look at all the articles and maybe say where are the authors from, what are the topics they covered, uh, how many did they do this thing or that thing. There's all kinds of things you can do with literature reviews. But in this course, we're looking only at how we do a literature review that focuses on theoretical concepts. And that's why I took the time to help you understand what a theoretical concept is. So a literature review will look at, suppose there's 20 studies that are, have been found. It will look at each of those 20 studies and find what are the theoretical concepts in those original primary studies. Where are the concepts? What are the concepts they define uh, between them? Then a theory mining review, a TMR, might also not only extract the concepts, but also extract what are the relationships that these primary studies, these 20 primary studies, linked between these concepts that they identified. And it might also extract, so when they said this relationship exists, what explanation do these primary studies give for these relationships? And it might also look at when it talked about these theories, uh, these concepts and their relationships, what are the bounding conditions? So uh, are, does this apply only for certain kinds of people? Like does it only apply for people under the age of 30? Does it apply only uh, for males but not for females or differently for males or females? Does it apply only in certain countries uh, with certain kinds of culture or not? So a lot of times primary studies will make those comments. So a TMR might also extract that. But as I said, so obviously some st uh, literature reviews might extract more detail or less, but in order to be called a theory mining review, it has to at least extract the concepts, systematically extract the concepts. And when I say systematic, I mean they have a particular focus. They are looking for concepts in each study and they are recording this study has these concepts, this other study has these concepts, and so on. That is what a theory mining review is. Okay? So, now, why is theory important? Um, again, theory defined as at least two concepts a relationship between them, an explanation of the relationship, and specifying the bounding conditions. First, you have to realize that theory is not equally important for all kinds of scholars. So there, the theory-oriented disciplines are mainly the disciplines that are called sciences, natural sciences and social sciences. So I include medicine and natural sciences, physics, biology, chemistry, uh, I think IC University doesn't have natural sciences, but IC University has a lot of social sciences. So management, information systems, that's my research field, communication studies, public health, education, sociology, anything that's called a social science. The, the reason it's called a science is because sciences, uh, science inherently uh, understands that there is an objective reality, and there's a way to study nature, even if it's socially constructed nature, 
to find out about that objective reality. And all sciences are interested in explaining why things happen and why things are related. That's what theory is all about. So anything that's called a natural science or is called a social science is interested in theory. And theory is extremely important. In fact, theory is king in the natural and social sciences. Uh, however, there are some uh, academic disciplines where theory is not that important. Uh, so some applied fields like engineering and computer science, and especially the humanities. So engineering and computer science, which are fields that are included in uh, IC University, and, and actually, my undergraduate degree was in computer science, uh, and I do some research that is more computer science than information systems, so I do both. Uh, not everything I do is theory-oriented. I do quite a lot of research that is not, does not have much theory uh, orientation. And these fields are, well, engineering and computer science are very applied. They're more interested in, does it work? And does it work well? They're not so interested in why does it work why it works is important but it's more important that it works as long as it works i'm happy with it the explanation can come later whatever that's kind of the attitude because and that's how inventions work that's how people invent new technology you just get it to work you don't have to theorize that uh, now theory is important and necessary to get there but sometimes you can get there, even if you have great theory, but it doesn't work well, who cares? That's the engineering computer science mentality. And they have very rigorous scholarly procedures for doing this. But theory is not the most important thing there. Humanities, uh, the things that make us, uh, the things that uh, are, touch people's soul lives, uh, arts, things that are beautiful. I, it needs to be beautiful, it needs to be lovely. Theory, I don't need to explain why, it just is, and here's why it is. Law, um, I, uh, here's how people make decisions, people have agreed to this, this is how you apply this law, what's the theory? There is legal theory, but it's not necessarily the most important thing there. So the reason I'm saying this is to, I recognize scholastically, theory is not so important to everyone. And that's okay. But probably most of us are in some of the fields, social sciences, where theory is important. Related to this, very closely related to this, is a lot of times you, in, you'll hear about rigor versus relevance. Uh, at least in information systems, this is a continuing discussion, rigor versus re relevance. And rigor talks about that you as a scholar, you need to follow very proper methodology. You, you need to, if you're doing an experiment, you have to remove all confounding factors. You have to control for alternative explanations so that you know that when you get your answer, you're really getting it. And it means being very detailed, very meticulous in your academic work. And um, a, a lot of uh, the, most, the most reputable academic journals require high rigor. Relevance means, so you've done research. Can real people do this? Or are you doing research that only other scholars will read and practitioners, the general public, have no interest in what you did. Scholars might think it's uh, relevant to saying that, hey, it needs to be important. It needs to actually be applicable, what people can actually do. So in theory-oriented disciplines, in the natural sciences and social science, rigor is the primary thing that uh, high-quality journals care about. Okay, so um, for theory-oriented disciplines, the natural social sciences, they care most for rigor. Um, and uh, a lot of the time, especially for the top quality journals, relevance might suffer. They might s care so much for rigor that people do stuff that's so rigorous, but it's not that relevant. And 
in the natural science, especially, they don't care about that because natural science, they talk about basic science where you're just doing scientific discovery. You don't care if people can apply it or not. It's new knowledge. And sometimes it might be 10 years, even 50 years before people eventually find applications for it, but it's because you've already done that work. In social science, it's not as easy to justify that, but that's a, a tension. In non-theory-oriented disciplines, relevance is very important, like in engineering, um, um, I won't speak so much about humanities. I'm not a humanities person at all, so I don't understand their epistemologies uh, and their academic standards as well, so I won't say too much. But um, I will say that in more applied disciplines, relevance is very important, and sometimes rigor might be sacrificed a little bit. Uh, but that's academics try to keep rigor. So, these two are often in tension, but I try to be both rigorous and relevant. Uh, both are very important, uh, and I think that's what we are scholars for. So, the way I do things is I always try to start with relevant research questions. I begin with that. So the alternative is, and what some people do, is they do a literature search. They look at, oh, a lot of scholars have said this is an important thing. And because scholars have said it, then that's my research topic. I, 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 do not, I never start my research with what scholars say. I, I try to start my research topic with what do practitioners need? What are the questions practitioners have? What are the struggles they're having? And then you can use rigorous research methods to answer those questions so that they are, you can have confidence in your answers. So I want to mention this tension uh, and recommend this approach. Start with practitioner uh, questions and then go on to, uh, and use rigorous standards to answer that. And so this methodology hopefully reflects that. Although uh, this course emphasizes the rigor aspect, I want to say right off the bat that we care very much for relevance, and you need to put that first as the context for applying your, your relevance. Okay, I need to move faster to make sure you complete everything here. Okay, so then the next question is, or the next item is, so why are theory mining reviews important? As I said, there's many different kinds of literature reviews, and I've talked about why theory is important in some fields that I think most of us uh, fall under. Okay, so why are theory mining reviews important? Well, for theory-oriented disciplines, uh, TMR, uh, theory mining reviews focus on what we care about. It focuses on theory. It helps to... So theory mind reviews extract the theory, it tr extracts the stuff, the core elements of theory from the primary s studies. So it makes theory much more accessible. Okay, so in trying to understand why theory review mind reviews are important, so um, in my research in literature reviews, it's gone through a lot of evolution. Uh, so one of the articles that I sent you about um, systematic literature views, uh, uh, let's see, let me remember the, the title exactly, uh, but this one, um, A Guide to Conducting a Standalone Systematic Literature Review. I actually, I've been working on that for many years, and that's where I started. And if you know this, there's very little mention about theory in here very little mention. When I had completed the core of this work, I felt, yes, it talked about a rigorous pr pr uh, procedure, but I felt something was missing. And as I continued to work on literature review theory, uh, methodology, I eventually realized what was missing was the theory focus. And so that's why I did the second major work, which is about theory mining reviews. And after identifying, okay, here's how, what is a theory mining review, 
what are the core elements, how do you do a good theory mind review, I eventually consider it like, but how do I know it's really important? So what I did is I looked at my field, information systems, and I was fortunate enough, um, uh, some other, some colleagues had done some work on literature reviews in our field, and they had found many literature reviews in our field. And so they shared the list of 98 with me. And I, uh, I looked at all of them. I examined all of them. And I looked at, are they theory mining reviews or not? And then I calculated, uh, I looked for different sources, how many citations they have. In other words, citation is when someone has um, read your work, so, well, someone has cited your work in their own work, and so there's different citation databases, mainly ISI, uh, Web of Science, and Google Scholar, that count the different cit numbers of citations each paper has had. And the idea is that the more an article is cited, presumably the more useful it is to other scholars. And so I found using different regression and ANOVA analysis that TMRs, theory mind reviews, are cited more highly than other kinds of literature reviews. Very clearly, very strongly. I even controlled for journal reputation. So even when someone does a theory mind review in a journal that does not have a high reputation, on average it is cited better than a literature review that is not theory mining in a journal of high reputation. And even when uh, a senior researcher uh, does a re literature review that is not theory mining, generally speaking, junior researchers that do theory mining reviews get better citations. Uh, so my point of that is that theory mining reviews are more valuable to the research community. And this is a very strong reason to that if you're going to do a literature review, do a theory mining review. Uh, it's more useful to you because you can build theory, you can answer and explain questions much better, and it's definitely, it, this uh, citation analysis shows it's more useful to the research community. Okay. So, uh, there are at least three different kinds of theory mining reviews, uh, and they're, they're, the differences are slight in some ways, but they are quite important because they have a lot of implications on how you do the review and what is appropriate in one kind of review or not. So the first kind, the simplest kind, is what I call a theory landscaping review. And I call it landscaping because you're exploring the research landscape. You're exploring what is out there, but you're doing it from a theory perspective. You're not just summarizing here are the topics that people have done, here are the research methods they've done. No, you're looking at what are the elements of theory in what other people have done uh, just in a broad scope. So the focus of a theory landscape review is a theme or a topic. So it might not start out with a, a theory as a focus. You have a topic. Uh, using my run example, maybe your topic is ICT investment. ICT investment is not a theory. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a concept. It's a theoretical concept if you measure it, but it's not a theory on its own. Or you can use something that's not even a theoretical concept. You can say, uh, I want to do research on... Um, maybe enterprise resource systems, open source enterprise resource systems, uh, uh, enterprise resource planning systems, so ERP, open source ERP. Uh, I know that's my topic of interest. I don't really know what I want to do about it, but that's my interest. And yeah, you can do a theory landscaping review and say that's your topic, but when you find the studies that treat that topic, what are you going to do with them? Well, you're going to find what is the theory in those studies. Even though you don't start with a theory, once you collect your studies, you look for the theory. 
So that is uh, a theory landscape and review, and it's a type of theory mine and review. The other two types you do when you do have a theory that you're starting out with. So having a theory means you have at least two concepts that you believe are related in some way. That's the minimum you need to call it a theory. Uh, sometimes it might be more than two concepts. There might be multiple concepts that are related to each other in different ways. But at least two concepts that have a relationship, that's a theory. So the next type is what I call a theory contending review. I've had a hard time naming that one. Uh, but contending means you're arguing for theory. Uh, I, I, I really avoided the term theory building review because all three types build theory but just in different ways. Okay, Okay. so um, so theory content in review starts with a theory, but it argues. It focuses on arguing for the theory because there's no empirical verification. So, you, you're, you, so if you have like 30 studies that you identify and you find which studies uh, have at least the two concepts or more at least two of the concepts in your theory then what are the relationships between them and you compare what each of these studies says about this relationship then you have to argue that the relationship is valid or maybe sometimes th these concepts are studied but there's very few studies that link the relationship that you're talking about therefore because of the so you might be the first one introducing that relationship, though not necessarily the concepts. But the main point of the theory contending review is that really you are arguing. You are arguing why this theory exists. You are arguing for a new explanation. And uh, it, it, the argumentation is a very strong part of that type of review. That's, that's the main item there. Because in theory landscaping, you don't need to argue so much. You're just saying, this is what people have done. This is a theory that people have looked at, and that's valuable. You don't have to say the theory is valid or not. You're just presenting it. But a theory containing review, you are arguing that this theory is valid. Uh, and yet, you don't have the empirical evidence to back that up uh, completely. But it's a strength of your argument that would carry the case. Or that would convince people. The theory testing review, on the other hand, is similar in the sense that you're focusing on theoretical relationships, again, at least two concepts at a time, but you do look only at articles that have tested that relationship with empirical data. And like maybe you find uh, 25 articles. And you find that, okay, 15 of them found that this relationship is valid. Uh, 10 of them found that it's not valid. 10 studies that have actually tested it with real data, not just argue that it's there. And then you would need to analyze why do those 15 find it's valid? Why did the 10 find it's not valid? Maybe they tested different contexts. Maybe one of them uh, looked at... Maybe the ones that found it to be valid, they did the, the study on students. And maybe the 10 that found it that it's not valid, they did the study on real organizations. So in the artificial classroom settings, this relationship appears to be there, but in real life settings, it's not there. And then that's what the theory test and review would, uh, that's an example of what it might conclude. So it, the key element there is that the theory test and review only uh, talks about, uh, only examines empirical primary studies, studies that have actually uh, done data analysis with real data. It does not include merely conceptual studies. So dissemination targets. Where can you publish your theory mind and review? Okay, so two perspectives. One is as a standalone article, and the other is as part of a doctoral thesis. So I know the main interest of this course is part of a doctoral thesis, but I want you to... The, the two articles I wrote are mainly 
consider someone is doing just a standalone research article for your professional life. It's not just for a doctoral thesis, but I'll come to that. So there's three steps uh, in the conduct of a full, when I say standalone, I mean just a research article that is a literature review article, a full article, not just a literature review section of uh, a study, but the entire article is a literature review. That's what I mean by a standalone literature review. So the first uh, output you would have is a protocol. And next week we'll talk in detail about a protocol. The protocol is just an outline of what you are going to do. You've not yet done it. It's just a plan for what you're going to do. So once, and there are steps to do that properly. It's non-trivial, uh, but next week we'll talk about that. Uh, the protocol can often be published in a conference. It might be just a brief conference poster session. A lot of conferences not just have the papers but uh, and main presentations, but they have a poster session, so just a brief outline. And sometimes a regular article in a conference. Uh, so for, because um, it depends on the academic field, but in a lot of social sciences, conferences do not have the same high standard as journal articles. And the reason for that is that you have less time to work on it, they have less space for it, uh, and so and it's expected to be work in progress that's not fully completed. So, and I have published uh, a protocol of a study I did in a conference poster session, so that's a possibility. Then, for a full uh, literature review, a pilot study is for any research study means that you have the main study you want to do, but you do a little project in advance, kind of. So the pilot study just means you've done, you've done all the steps. So you've gone all the way to the end, but it's kind of like a first draft. You've not done everything you can do. It's, for example, maybe you do a search and you find that there's maybe 80 studies that apply to your topic. They said, okay, l let's just look at the top 10. Let's you know, look at 10 of those and let's do those 10 in depth. Because when you do the 10 in depth, you know it's not complete, but by going through all the steps, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn maybe there are some things that are harder than you thought they would do. Uh, or maybe you even find some new topics that are more interesting. You might change your topic. You might adjust it before you look at all the 80 articles in depth, which will take a lot more time. So it's kind of like a first draft, but not just writing. You actually do the research. It's like a first round uh, run of the research. So because of the limited time in a semester course, uh, for this course, your assignment will be to do a pilot study. So the protocol, you specify everything you would do for a full study, but a pilot study will not be quite a full study. It will be, you just take some of the articles and you do the, those articles in depth, but it's more manageable. The outcome of that can usually be published in a conference. A lot of conferences will take that. Uh, it's usually shorter. And uh, they understand, okay, it's not quite complete. You could do more, but it, is, it does tell something that is a contribution to knowledge, even if it it's, could be built upon. Then when you do the full complete study, that would be a journal article. Uh, that could be published as a standalone literature review in uh, a high quality journal. From the doctoral thesis perspective, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how IC University does it. I know that some universities uh, allow doctoral students to uh, either do the traditional one big dissertation with maybe six or more chapters, uh, but, some, you, uh, but also let doctoral students do a dissertation which consists mainly of three published articles. And they can accept that if you've done three full articles that are submitted or published in academic journals, that can be accepted as your full dissertation. Uh, if it were a three article thesis, then this journal article I described could be one of them. But in a traditional doctoral thesis, 
so here's where a theory mining review could fit in. The theory landscape in review, I think, is really the most general and works very well for a literature review chapter. Because a lot of time, uh, when you're starting out, you don't know. It, you know your topic of interest. And so most of you, you have a topic of interest, but you might not necessarily know what the theory is in it that you want to contribute to. A theory literature review is excellent for helping you figure out what are the theories out there. And at the same time, you're doing it in a way that's useful not just for yourself, but it's useful for other people. And even though it's for the literature review chapter of your thesis, it can be published as a standalone article afterwards. Okay. Then for theory uh, contending review, you would do this for your literature review chapter mainly when you already, at least you have two concepts that you know you're interested in and you're exploring the relationship between them and you're tr trying to build the theory that you will eventually test empirically for your dissertation. And so there, uh, the, lit the, the core literature search and discussion part will be part of your literature review chapter. But because theory contending reviews are not just descriptive or presentational, there's a lot of strong argument. So a lot of what is there is very suitable for the theory development chapter. So that is where you would generate your hypotheses, generate your propositions. Whereas for theory la landscape review, you might have lots of theories that you find exist in the literature. And maybe there are some theories that people have suggested, but no one has tested. And then you might end up taking one of them, and that becomes the aspect that you develop in theory development and eventually test. Then theory uh, testing review is very rare for a doctoral thesis because the main, ap the main way to do a theory testing review is a meta-analysis. And I'll talk more about that next week and even more later on in the semester. Uh, a meta-analysis means that you look, again, only at primary studies uh, that have actually tested empirical data and they are only quantitative. A theory uh, meta-analysis does not include any qualitative primary studies. It only looks at qu quantitative studies that do some sort of statistical analysis. And it does a statistical analysis of those statistical analysis studies to find out what is the overall effect from all of them combined. So it's very rare for a doctoral dissertation, except if you're empirical analysis for your doctoral dissertation is a meta-analysis. And uh, some supervisors allow that, others don't uh, allow that. So it, if the entire dissertation is a meta-analysis, because it is a lot of work, then that could be used, then that's the entire dissertation. And this methodology will explain everything. But if that's not the case, then you would not use uh, theory test and review for your doctoral dissertation. The big question is, so what kind of TMR should you do? I explained for a doctoral dissertation, but I want to show you generally for a standalone review. And in this PowerPoint slide, I know these words are very small. So that's why I sent you a separate PDF uh, that has, uh, yeah, that has this more explicitly. Okay, so please look at the PDF as I go over it. It'll be much easier to see. Okay, so it has something like this. I'll try to expand it to be more visible on the screen. Okay. Okay, so here, uh, the first question is, um, let me see if I can, yeah. So you want to, you start here, you want to conduct a TMR. You want to conduct a theory mining review. So based on this, you've been convinced that this is the way to go. Then the first decision is, do you have a specific research question? So a specific, so you're fairly clear what your research question is. So 
if you don't, then no. Then next, you choose a topic that interests you and is important to many people. So this is what I talked earlier about relevance. Uh, it needs to be relevant, so it's important to many people, but it has to interest you. You have to do what's, uh, you can't do academic research that's not interesting to you, otherwise it's torture. <laughs> so it has to be interesting to you, but it also needs to be relevant to many people. And then, uh, you're going to do you're going to do a TLR. If you don't know what your topic, your research question is to begin with, you're going to do a theory landscaping review because a theory landscaping review will help you find the, the the topic of interest. So after you have your general topic, you need to clearly define the scope of your topic of interest. Okay, and then you're going to conduct a theory landscaping review. So there's that path. So again, so if at the beginning you do have a specific research question, then you ask yourself, okay, try to formulate the research question in theory format, and that's in terms of concepts and relationships. So again here, I have to really apologize for the technical details, uh, the technical delays we had that uh, we lost an hour, because I wanted to spend time in class to do an exercise where you would look at your topic and try to formulate, uh, look at your research question, but from what we've learned today in terms of theory, can you think of it in terms of theory or not? Uh, but unfortunately, you have to do that as a homework assignment on your own. We can't do that in class for lack of time. But the thing to note there is that Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Some research questions are not in theory format, and you don't have to force it to be. If you cannot make it theory format, and theory format means you identify distinct concepts, at least two distinct concepts that are related to each other. If you cannot do that, then you're going to do a theory landscape review. That's okay. You can still do theory mining. Uh, but you you have to you have your research question and you have to clearly define what is the scope of your topic of interest and you do a theory landscape and review. Uh, however, if you can formulate your research question in terms of at least two distinct concepts that are related to each other, then you have a choice of theory uh, con uh, contending review or theory uh, testing review. The question would then be, are there many empirical tests of the theory available? So you have your theory, you have your two concepts, their relationship, have a lot of people, and a lot is relative, but at least 10. Are there at least 10 studies, hopefully more, that have tested this empirically, that have people have actually done collected data and done analysis uh, on this theory. If no, then you have no choice there. You you can only conduct a theory uh, contending review, and you follow those procedures. However, if there are, if those empirical tests are available, you don't have to do theory testing. The question now is: Are you more interested in better or understanding or improving the theory? Is that what you want to do? Or do you want to test the theory? So especially, now if many people have done empirical tests and they all have exactly the same result, then there's no test to do. Uh, it's only when there are conflicting results. Some are positive, some are negative. Then you might consider doing a theory testing review to look at them and say, why are some positive, why are some negative? Why are there different results? That's when you do a theory test and review. Uh, but regardless, if you're, even if there are conflicting results, but you're more interested in better understanding it or improving it, then you would conduct a theory, con uh, a theory contending review. And so, how do you conduct these reviews? So that's the theory mining article that I sent you. It it, it tells you. So you follow the eight steps. 
But in each of the eight steps, sometimes there's different instructions for each of these three kinds. And that's what you need to follow. So uh, specifically, uh, there's, in the theory mining review article, there's a summary table of that. Um, let's see, let me try to find that. So yes, so table two has the eight steps and it explains the differences in the eight steps for these three kinds of reviews. And, and that's why it's important to, uh, so, let me put that there. Yeah, so that's why it's important to identify from the very beginning what kind of review are you trying to do, and then you know what adaptations will be necessary. So throughout the semester, we'll talk about these differences, but it's all presented here in, in this article. Okay, so let me get back to the presentation. So that's, uh, um, and so this is related to what I presented. The question, can I frame my research topic in theory uh, structure? So that's, in this chart, that's referring to this question here. Are you able to formulate the research question in theory format? So here's how you do that. The question is, what kind of concepts are you dealing with? So in your research question, your research topic, are they, is it a variance theory, is it process theory, is this a systems theory? And a lot of times it's none of the above. It might be just be a theme or a topic or an idea, and that's okay. In that case, you, you have to do a theory landscape and review. You don't have, uh, the other two are not options. But if you can formulate it, either from variance process or systems perspective, then you know you are dealing with concepts. You either do a theory contending review or a theory testing review. And most of the time it will be theory contending review. Now, one comment, I wish I had more time, but you know what, I'm going to talk more about this last topic. Um, I'll talk more about that next week. Thank you. Because um, it's, it's quite important and we've run out of time for that. But I'll just briefly summarize. and. But in summary, uh, a lot of you, almost all of you, in your research topic, you're saying you want to study this and such and such topic in Cameroon. I want to such, touch and such topics in Central African countries. I want to talk about such and such topic in developing countries. That, there's a problem with that from a theory perspective. And the problem is why does your theory only apply to, the, to that region. You should not confuse the fact that maybe your data collection will only be in that reason, region, and that's okay, but that doesn't, that should not mean that your theory only applies to that region. So I'll talk a lot more about that next week, but, but even between now and then, just think about that. The why does your theory only have to apply to your region? And I strongly recommend don't do that. Do a general theory, but your data collection is just in your region. That's fine, but don't say the theory only applies to region unless you have very strong reasons for saying so. Okay.